Hello and welcome back. Eddie Radosovich, George Stoya here from the Suterscoop.com studios. We got Josh down at Houston at Suterscoop HQ. Uh, Houston headquarters, I guess is what we're going to call it. Good win for the Astros on uh, Sunday night, Josh. Is that your team right now? Are you an Astros fan? I I hear the condescension, Eddie. I do. And, and it was you know, a good it's win. fair, it's deserved. But, uh, I mean, you didn't take yeah, two or three th from the that Dodgers, was but there's only one team that did this weekend, and that was the Chicago Cubs. Neither here nor there. Oh, uh, a recruiting oh. report for the week uh, coming off of a uh, kind of a big weekend at Adorbent, obviously, with the Heisman hangout and uh, a guy that we actually saw a couple weeks ago. We kind of figured that it was going to be close, uh, but they finally did it. They got another commitment in the 2025 class. Marcus Wimberly, a safety out of Bauxite, Arkansas, I, th I believe is how we're going to say it. We'll probably uh, get caught up to speed on that. Not too often do we talk about some of these Arkansas uh, towns, but, uh, you know, John Calipari is going to probably have to learn them here uh, shortly, too. So uh, good commitment, though, Josh. And it was something that I think that when we both talked to him down at the uh, Under Armour Dallas event, uh, we both walked away and kind of looked at each other. It was like, yep, that's a Brent Venables guy. It comes to fruition. He makes the uh, commitment on Saturday. Absolutely. There are guys you just talk to and you know, like you're like, ah, it may be something could go crazy here, but his talking points, like I felt like he could have held a Brent Venables press conference. Like he could have just stepped in and spoken on Brent's behalf and a lot of the, the things he liked about Oklahoma now. And I know some will ask, you know, where is that interview where we had some technical issues? It didn't get to run. But he was great. I mean, he really, uh, you know, I know that's kind of like. It was that, a great interview. Take our word for it. Yeah. Yeah. So just believe us. It was good. Uh, but no, he he was very, um, very sincere and just kind of talked about uh, a lot of the things that we all know Brent Venable's values. You know, they talk about, you know, he talked about just the program, the culture. He talked a lot about, you know, the soul mission and, and Brent's faith and how much, you know, he is a. Uh, Marcus is a very faith driven guy as well. So, I mean, I, th those things really worked for, you know, his recruitment. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, it, it's surprising on a timeline scale to me. Uh, and I, I, Marcus and I talked kind of briefly on Saturday night, got a few quotes for a story, looking to kind of catch up with him this afternoon and have a little bit more with him. But uh, my, my feeling coming out of that interview, Eddie was, this guy's going to go to Oklahoma, but it won't be until the summer. So I, I thought we had more time to kind of cover and see where this was going to go. And, you know, he recently visited Alabama, picked up an offer from Alabama. So, I mean, this is a guy that I, I see people saying like, oh, three-star. I'm like, guys, he's got Tennessee, Oregon, Michigan, Alabama. I mean, like I, the the schools that you want to gauge a player by, most of them wanted Marcus Wimberly. Josh, you mentioned the you mentioned the schools: Michigan, Utah, Oregon, Arkansas. You going to Alabama? And, uh, he, I mean, schools wanted this guy. What are some of his his best qualities as a safety, and do you have a comp for him? You know, it, it's funny because of the the visit weekend. I still haven't finished the breakdown, so I'm actually working on that. That should be out here probably before this even. You know, uh, most people are reading this, but when I watch Marcus, what I like about him is this is a guy that while he is, he's clearly a safety. He's not going to play corner. He's not one of these tweeners that's going to work itself out. But what I think is interesting is he shows some ability in coverage. He's not a guy that gets lost uh, out in space. You know, when Eddie and I saw him at the uh, Under Armour camp uh, last month, I thought he looked very natural working, you know, against a elite wide receiver. You know, you put him out there against a Corey and Moore, Elijah Thomas or something like that. Okay, he's gonna that that's gonna be a lot for him to deal with one on one in a camp setting, but in a game like you put him up over a running back or a tight end or even kind of a slot receiver, like I, I think he can do some things or he can be okay. Um, and then you watch the tape; the kid's physical. I mean, it, it's not surprising that Brent Venables and Brandon Hall love this kid because there is more than one clip where he is just clobbering somebody, and he's one of those guys. Um, you know, we talk about all the time, like. He is 100% invested in every hit. There are no business decisions. This isn't what this guy is about. He just lays everything he's got on every single clip. What do you make of uh, just the kind of the safety position as a whole? We've talked about even going into a little bit of the team side of stuff. We've talked about how Brandon Hall has basically revamped that entire room. In terms of 2025, what do you see kind of fit as far as the rest of that safety group? 
yeah, you know, th- the safety room, it's a possibility that could come exclusively from the state of Arkansas. I know a Marion Robinson, another guy from the, the natural state, is a guy that Oklahoma is really high on. I think he's going to come down to Oklahoma and Oregon. He's a quiet guy, doesn't say a lot. It's kind of hard to know what he's thinking, where he's at. But I definitely think, um, you know, like I said, Oklahoma, Oregon, uh, and there's some others that are trying to get involved there. But he's a guy, you know, a little underrated in my opinion, but I love the tape. He's a very natural center fielder, big, long guy, plays receiver in high school and is very natural when the ball is in the air. You can kind of see that I'm sure some schools wouldn't mind recruiting him as a receiver. He's just a gifted athlete. And uh, a guy that Brandon Hall has been on since very early on, they've put a lot of focus on him. And then obviously the, the other, the, the kind of elephant in the room is Jonah Williams, because everybody, I got a lot of questions about that this weekend. That's why Uh, I wanted to ask, because does uh it affect anything with what Jonah Williams is doing with Oklahoma? Well, you know, and the professional videographer, video, video guy that I am, I know to save Jonah Williams to last. You, you know, I don't want you to speed through it. So wait for the Jonah Williams information. But no, uh, you know, I had a lot of people ask me, like, does this mean no use out on Jonah Williams? Absolutely not. Don't d- Jonah Williams is one of those, you know, and every school has probably five to ten guys in any given year. They'll wait as long as they need to wait. Like how, you know, if uh, Ty Haywood's one of those guys, Michael Fasusi's one of those guys. Like Oklahoma is going to have a spot for that guy until – you know, the 2025 season kicks off like that. That's, that's where that is. So um, Jonah, what I think this does and what I think is interesting is it provides a lot of flexibility. So if Oklahoma can go get a Marion Robinson, okay, you've got your two safeties. You're in great shape. If that's all you get, that's okay. That's a really solid safety class. A lot for, uh, you know, Brandon Hall to continue to build on, but you can still chase Jonah Williams. And let's say you land him and he goes to baseball. You're still okay. And let's say he comes, and you, you've got all three guys. You know what? That's just a great problem to have. It, it's it's not unlike what Oklahoma's looking at now with Peyton Bowen, Robert Spears Jennings, and Billy Bowman all being safeties that we all think are fully capable of being starters. Josh, is, uh, is Brandon Hall the hottest recruiter on staff right now in terms of just the last couple years? I mean, I you can probably say that about, guy. about several guys. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay, okay Eddie. I support everybody. Uh but uh, I mean, you could. I guess we could make that case for Emmett Jones. I mean, Jay Valai's done really well. I mean, the defensive line class. But it just seems like Brandon Hall has has just steadily been really, really good recruiting for them at safety. I think when you put the whole package together, I don't think there's anybody on the staff that is doing a better job positionally. From you know, you talk about guys that you know. Peyton Bowen. Everybody wanted Peyton Bowen. That's a great win in recruiting, and it looks like Peyton Bowen is developing into that player everybody kind of hoped he could be. Uh, But then you talk about development. Look at Robert Spears Jennings, a guy that was pretty much a high school wide receiver until his senior year where Broken Arrow kind of moved him over a little bit, and he did play a lot of DB. Um, But this is, uh, you know, he he looks like he's going to start. Billy Bowman's growth has been very, very easy to see under Brandon Hall. And then, you know, you talk about all these young guys that we're hearing good stuff about, like, oh, this guy's coming along. This guy's going to be a good player. There is just so much that is working for Brandon Hall right now. It's not just, oh, he's a great recruiter. We don't know what he is a developer. Oh, he's, you know, a great developer, but we don't know if he can evaluate the underrated guys. He can, you know, if he's, if he gets a five star, he's great. I just think he is doing an outstanding job and is one of those guys that, you know, We all know when this staff was hired, he was kind of one of those guys that was some of the fans, I think, treated like a throw in like, well, you know, you knew Brent was going to get hired. He was going to hire one of his guys. Brandon's one of his guys. Brandon Hall is one of the, I would say, if you looked around college football, one of the more underappreciated staffers anywhere in the country, in my opinion. We'll stay on the uh, defensive side of the ball. Plenty of guys to get into uh, or to continue to kind of talk about here uh, with Marcus Wimberly. Obviously, he made the commitment. Uh, somebody else that I know that you've been really high on and somebody that you saw during the fall, Kobe Sellers sounds like had a pretty good time this weekend, the uh, defensive back out of Shadow Creek High School. Yeah, it, it was funny because, you know, coming into the weekend, I thought Oklahoma was in a really good place, probably – you know, out in front by some distance. I think Texas is giving them the most chase of anybody at the moment. But when I talked to people kind of around Houston, it was kind of like, ah, you know, I don't know. 
Saturday night, Sunday morning, I got at least three messages from people that I, I would think would know and were like, this may be moving faster than we thought, you know, like kind of a, Hey, may, maybe you did have this right. And I'm not, that's not a pat me on the back thing. That is, I think Oklahoma really made an impression over the weekend. I, I think they are continuing to build with him. His family loves Jay Valai. Uh, you mentioned me getting to see Kobe. Uh, I think that was late October this year, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, of, of the 2023 season. And uh, talked with his mom, talked with his dad after the game. And clearly there was a lot of just like a parent feeling like they could trust their kid going to play with, you know, play for Jay Valai, that he was going to look out for Kobe and those kind of things. So I think that's been a big part of this equation. At the same time, you know, we talk about the development of that safety room. Look at the corner room. All of a sudden there's depth and there's talent and there's all this stuff. And so, again, I think that Jay Valai is establishing himself as a a really key and, you know, helpful piece to Oklahoma staff. And, uh, again, we I know we'll get into some of this, but uh, Kobe is. He's a guy I like and I think is a, you know, fringy top 150 guy for on three right now. Josh, you mentioned this thing's moving a little bit faster than maybe some anticipated. Do you have any idea when he might want to make a decision? I really don't. And I, what I would guess from Kobe, just you know, knowing him and talking to him a lot, my bet would be that maybe he takes one more visit. Maybe he goes and sees Texas one last time before he does anything. He just kind of has that due diligence kind of mindset. Like, I'm, I'm going to check everything. I want to make sure I'm not getting caught up in this. Um, now in the ultimate hedge at the same time, if he had a graphic tomorrow, not going to shock me. Like I, I mean, that that's where it is. I think Oklahoma, like I said, went from maybe 65% in my book to it's about an 80%. Like I, I I'm going to be very surprised at this point if it's not Oklahoma. And I do think it'll be probably before any summer official visits happen. So um, now again, maybe somebody can get in there and slow him down a little bit and want him, you know, to take a couple looks around and see what else is out there. But this is a kid that's seen a lot and he's been around, you know, he plays at shadow Creek. There's a lot of division one players. He's got a teammate committed to Texas. So there is, there's a lot there that he already kind of knows. And I think it's interesting to kind of see that. I think this is still moving in the, in, in the direction it currently is. Like I said, I, if you made me guess, is he committed to OU by, let's say, May 1st? I would say he's probably in the boat. All right, Josh, we've been told to stop recording to go look at the uh, eclipse. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I'm with my kids out there. It's fine. BRB. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got you. <laughs> are, the girls, are the girls out of school? Or, or the eclipse? Shut up. They're out of school today. I they had no school not. today for the eclipse? Correct. That's Correct. insane. That is it's the damnedest wild. thing I've ever seen. I, I, I swear. Like I've become the old man. It's like I was in school every day of my life. Like it, it's. But I, that's that's that another dead. level. Like it's one thing yeah, to like. It's insane. All right, welcome back. We had to uh, run outside, and uh, thank you to the Stoyle family. We were able to do so. We shout out mom. Put off the uh, what are these glasses? Sunglasses. Solar glasses. It's it's okay. I I get the appeal. Maybe no. I, I think the eclipse is a lot like going to see the uh, Green Canyon. You step out, you, you see, see it, it, you go, okay, yeah. that was awesome. I think Dallas is getting a little bit better than uh, than us here in Oklahoma City. Neither here nor there. Back to the recruiting side of things. A bunch more to get into in terms of the Heisman hangout. And, uh, you know, maybe a name that a lot of people are maybe unfamiliar with right now, but I think you're over the next couple years, you will starting you will start to become more familiar with it. 2026 defensive lineman, defensive tackle out of Owasso, Taj Overton. Uh, apparently had a really nice time at his uh, on his visit to uh, Norman over the weekend. Yeah, I know it's going to upset Oklahoma fans that there is another in-state offensive lineman that both likes Oklahoma and is really, really good. I, I don't know what is happening right now in the state of Oklahoma where all these defensive linemen are starting to pour out, but it is a problem Britt Venables will, will gladly accept. Um but yeah, uh, Taj is a guy, and he's interesting because you know I was talking to you guys before we got started. He is not one that's going to say the big gushy quote. He's not going to give me the you know oh this was incredible and I just you know it impacted my family. Like it's not like that. 
But what he does say in brief, you're like, okay, like he he's telling me something there. Um, I I will say this: I'm getting closer and closer to putting in a prediction for him, uh, and it's early for him. He's got a long way to go. I think he's going to pick up a lot more offers before it's all said and done. But I just think his relationship is really starting to grow with Todd Bates. I think he feels very comfortable. He is a guy that I get the impression, like a. It's certain with Tulsa guys, it's always an interesting thing. Like some are Oklahoma's the perfect distance because they're a little way from home, but they can get back home and see mom and dad whenever they want to. It's it, it's easy enough. And then some guys are like, I want to get out of state and I want to just do something different. So it, it's very interesting. But he feels like one of those guys where Oklahoma's about right for him as far as where he wants to be. He hasn't taken a lot of trips yet. Uh, but you know, I would say of the, if he's taken five, three of them have been to Oklahoma. So I, I think that is telling kind of where he stands. And every time I talk to him, he just talks about, you know, getting to watch the, uh, this weekend. He loved just getting to watch the guys practice, talking to the players a little bit. I think it started to feel more like, you know, not that he's a part of this, but just starting to feel more at ease with more and more people around the program. Josh, six, six foot three, 275, a, a lot to like about him. I know that his tape stands out. I know that the, the players aren't that big right now, Oklahoma State, Arkansas, Kansas State, or some of the schools that are, are kind of looking at him. Do you expect any other bigger schools maybe to, to get in play here? I know that OU always is seeming to, to fight off you know Texas A&M, LSU, those types of schools. Do you expect any of those schools to maybe get more involved? I, I would expect so, and I think yeah. this year – you could see a lot of that happen. Kind of maybe one of those guys that, because I know a lot of schools, as they get into the summer, unless you camp, you don't see a lot of offers go out. So maybe if he hits up some camps, and I don't know Taj's plans on that just yet, um, but a lot of schools will wait. They want to watch those first three games of your junior year, and then they'll really get a feel for, okay, this guy is, you know, he's an offer guy. He's a guy we're going to wait on. You know, they kind of start to delineate where, where players fall for them. Um, and I think that is what you'll see here. And I do, I think you're going to see more offers come in now with what I'm talking about, where it feels like Oklahoma is starting to, you know, be a real presence in this recruitment and really making him a priority. You wonder, do some schools kind of say, ah, you know, we don't, we don't even know if we need to mess with it less and less though. That's an issue. You know, like uh, again, Marcus Wimberly, who we talked about earlier, Alabama offered him just a short while ago. Like, and everybody kind of knew Oklahoma is going to be tough to beat in this thing. Um, and they went ahead and threw their hat in the ring just to see, you know, kind of see what it would be like, get him in for a visit, go through all those steps. So I, I think that is it. 10 years ago, schools would hesitate. Now it's just, we're going to offer everybody that we think is of our level. And then we'll kind of figure out who our priorities are and, you know, who are the guys that we actually have a chance to land seems like it's been a while since Oklahoma's had a defensive tackle guarding, garnering this type of attention, maybe this early in the process, and especially when you consider that he's going into his junior year. The only reason I ask this, because he's from the Tulsa area, any relation to uh, Hugh Overton, who just graduated from Oklahoma a couple years ago? I don't think so. Sure. But I need to. I, I've, I've never actually just flat out asked Taj yeah. that question. But I've ne nobody's ever mentioned it to me, and that's one of those things that, like, Q was such a big deal in Tulsa. Like you feel like somebody would have thrown it out and been like, yeah, that's his cousin or, you know, just some loose relation or whatever it might be. But I haven't heard anything like that, but I don't want to say, yeah, that's definite fact because I'm just not sure because I've never asked him specifically. Well, if he is, I'm, I'm sure that there's a defense coordinator over at Jinx America that would uh, love to have him a part of the program here moving forward in the next couple of years. Be interesting to watch, though, with uh, with Taj Overton, the 2026 defensive tackle. Staying in the state of Oklahoma, going to basically the other end of the state, uh, down in the southwest corner, Anthony Ojumoro from Elgin, Oklahoma. Not a school that, kind of like Piccolo, not a school that uh, is usually on our spring tour, but it certainly seems like that is going to be the case with uh, Big Tony down there. He is a massive human at 6'5", 290, comes in uh, over the uh, course of the weekend. Offensive guard, possibly, but it sounds like, uh, you know, there is definitely some interest there from uh, both sides. Yeah, you know, every week, it's interesting because every time he's been up there, he's kind of come back with a different thing that caught his eye, you know, just what, you know, and because I always ask, you know, is there something, because, you know, every guy, oh, the visit was great. Uh, okay, what what is it? Like, what what is that thing? And 
I think within those answers, sometimes they'll give you, it's not so much what they say, it's what they're talking about. You know, oh, the facilities were great. Okay. I, everywhere you go, the facilities are great. Like that doesn't stick out. But what he talked about that I thought was really interesting was he was talking about his conversation with Brent Venables. And he wouldn't really go into detail, and I didn't. I didn't want to press him because obviously that's uh, Brent Venables wasn't looking to be quoted when he's having that conversation. But there was, um, you know, he just talked a lot about kind of the the family structure of the program, and you know how much they were going to, you know, kind of invest in their players. You know, it, it, and and not from uh, guys. We know in this era, I have to say this, but not from a financial standpoint, just like we're going to put time into you. We care about you. We're, you know, you're going to be part of our family. And I think that really resonated with them because I know, it, it, again, this is a family that, you know, his father has been in the U.S. military. There's been a lot of travel. So I, I think they are very accustomed to like a very tight family bond because they're constantly moving around and having to, you know, make new friends and build new relationships. And they're, the one thing that's kind of constant for them is that family. And I think that is something that when Brent talked about that, I think it really hit a note for him. So, again, I, I, another guy that I'm pretty close to putting in a prediction for, I think Oklahoma is in really, really strong shape here. Uh, and, you know, uh, is a um, is a guy that I, is athletic enough to play tackle. But I think you're right. I think when you look at, Oklahoma offering him over guys like Blake Cherry at Owasso, Broderick Scholl at Bixby, uh, you know, uh, some of the other really good offensive linemen in the state of Oklahoma right now, I think it's telling that, okay, this could be an interior guy to go along with Owen Hollenbeck, who they see as their future center. Josh, I was just about to say that we've talked a lot about this offensive line class and what it could be. I mean, where does he? I mean, is he a big part of this this puzzle, or is, or are there other guys, especially being in state? You mentioned some of the other guys in state. I mean, how big of a boost would that be for for Bill Bedenboe? I think it's a big win because, again, this is a guy that's just learning the game. Like yeah. he's still very raw, still feeling his way through it. But yet you watch his junior tape and you're like, holy crap. I mean, he's he's playing in North Carolina. There's a good level of competition out there. And he's just bullying guys. And again, not just a case where, oh, he's bigger than everybody else. He moves around really naturally. He's very fluid in his, you know, kind of his movements. He can slide, um, can do a lot of the things that you require. So again, I think tackle is not off the table. I just think it's kind of one of those conversations we get into a lot where where does his brightest future? What, what What is the place where he can go the farthest in football? And I think it's probably at guard because I, I could easily see him pulling around, doing a lot of the counter stuff that we know Oklahoma's kind of made one of the foundational pieces of its offense through the years. So um, I think that is a very real possibility for him. But yeah, I, I think it's a big win for Oklahoma. And I think when you look at it, it to me, what I would say when you look at, you know, how do you kind of gauge this recruitment? Look at who they haven't offered. Look at the, uh, the big offensive lineman from Kansas, whose name's escaping me, who's come down for a visit. has got a bunch of good offers, really good player that I know is very high on Oklahoma. And I apologize, I'm just blanking on the kid's name at the moment. He is He's a guy that Oklahoma has chosen not to offer at this point in time. They did offer Antony. So like you kind of say, what is that telling me? So I think, A, Oklahoma feels pretty confident, and, B, they really like him. So I, I think that is kind of a uh, just an all-around good sign. And it's a sign of Oklahoma building this offensive line class in the way that we've talked about for six months that they were going to need to. We've talked about how important this 2025 class is. I think anybody that has followed along with what we've talked about in terms of what they have on campus right now know that they need to continue to build the depth. Does it start in any way, start becoming a little bit of a numbers game, or is it different for him as opposed to when you're talking about Ty Haywood and Michael Fasusi and all of those guys, that it does help that he's able to slide inside and maybe it won't affect him as much? Yeah, I, I think that is, that's really the case. Because, I mean, guys, we know that <laughs> any any blend of Babalola, Rogers, um, you know, Ty Haywood, Michael Fasusi, those guys – Oklahoma is going to have a spot for them. They're going to make those numbers work like sure. that. That's just, that's going to happen. They're not going to get all those guys. We know that too, but with this situation, I think it does give him some time, some patience. Now they did make a new offer. Uh, a Logan Powell, I believe is his name, a kid from Arizona 
that got offered after a visit he made, I believe, a week ago today. I think mm-hmm. he was on campus last Monday, and Oklahoma actually made the offer on Tuesday. So, uh, and is another interior guy from what I can gather. So, I think Oklahoma is not going to sit around forever. But I do, they know this kid's new to all this. It's all, you know, like there's a lot to be learned. He's not a kid that's like bound to the state that knows everything about OU or anything like that. So there's a lot for him to process. And I think Oklahoma's willing to be patient. But at the same time, does he have the same, you know, patience that Oklahoma's going to show to Ty Haywood? Probably not. But I do think he has more than maybe the average guard that they're just kind of you know, oh, we like him, but we're not crazy about him. I do think they like him and are willing to give him a little uh, a little time to kind of figure this all out. And who knows? I mean, it, as you said, I, if the kid just literally started playing football two years ago, there's only, uh, you know, there is a plenty of mon- uh, amount of room that he's going to be able to grow just as a player here over the next uh, year, you know, year and a half until he gets uh, to wherever he needs to be in terms of uh, college. So should be interesting. Offensive line, it's big talking point here in 2025 and it's going to be even more important if you can lock some of these guys down within the state lines Keenan Harris another player that uh visited Oklahoma for the Heisman hangout over the weekend a 6-1 200 safety this he's actually out of the 2026 class we started blending these guys in 25 and 26 St. Louis Missouri St. Louis University High School uh yeah a big athletic guy he's a kid that I've only watched a little bit of tape on, but I have talked to some people in the area and they they rave about him. Like I think right now at on three, I think he's a high three star. I, I the vibe I get is he'll end up as a top one fifty guy in the country. Like there are there are people up there that are really, really excited about him. Um St. Louis University has a uh the St. Louis University high, I know that mm-hmm. gets confusing for people. Um has a really good track record of producing major prospects. Just last year, uh, Wingo that's at Texas now. So there is plenty of history there. But, you know, the first thing he says to me when I talk to him is like, I love that I can't wait to come back. And that's always, for a guy this early, coming to his first visit, picks up his offer, that's a huge, uh, that's a really good sign. That That is kind of the first words you want to hear because there was nothing going to be decided this weekend. That wasn't the way that was going to go. So it's just about, is Oklahoma done enough where they're going to be in this race going forward, or did he get his offer and he's kind of kind of over it now? So I, I think that's a really good sign for Oklahoma that he'll be back. I don't know when yet. Uh, wouldn't shock me if it's this summer, comes down in camps maybe. Because I think Oklahoma's done a very good job with that, where even guys that already have the offers, they usually have them back down. But I, I think Oklahoma's off to a good start there. Uh, had one of his teammates down as well, the running back, uh, Jordan Taylor. So I, I think Oklahoma is doing a a nice job kind of just getting started there. And we all know how much Brent loves to recruit Kansas, Missouri, the whole area. No doubt. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, guys that also were on uh, campus over the course of the weekend, Josh, was there anybody that maybe you talked to that – you didn't think it was going to be a major, major visit or anything like that, and then you come out of the weekend and you go, now wait a second, maybe Oklahoma's a little bit of a bigger player than we thought he they were going into the weekend? I, You know, I'm trying to think of someone that... There's a lot of knowns out there, it seems, right now. Yeah, because like I said, there, there weren't a lot of huge surprises sure. um, as far as, you know, who was going to be there, that kind of thing. But as I kind of look over the list... Um, the guy I will say that I uh, I got some intel on kind of through the weekend that uh, kind of surprised me. I, I feel like I'm being very dramatic here. I don't mean to be. Um, is Dawson Merritt, the linebacker from Overland Park. He actually came in on Thursday um, and has stayed a little while longer than some of the other guys. But this is a guy that had meant to take the trip a couple of times and finally was able to make it down. I have heard from some people – kind of around his high school program, I guess I would say, that he is very big on Oklahoma and kind of a, you know, like if they were going to pick, if anybody around the school was going to pick where he might end up, most of them might bet on Oklahoma. So I think that's a good sign. Um, very athletic guy. And I think what what you're seeing is Zach Alley starting to narrow his focus a little bit at linebacker. Uh, Dawson Merritt's one of those guys. Um you know, Ty Jackson, who was uh, from Florida, the big top 100 guy that was expected in this weekend. So 
you go down the list and look at all those guys and you're like, oh, okay. Like, I think it was 10, 12 guys. You know, you had Elijah Barnes from Skyline. I think Oklahoma maybe is moving on from him a little bit and focusing in a little bit different direction. So, uh, again, I like what Oklahoma is doing at linebacker. And Dawson Merritt, for those that don't know, that's a top 100 guy in the country in what is just an absurdly good year in the state of Kansas where a top 100 guy is only the third best player in the state just because Babalola, Lincoln Cure, Dawson Merritt, and Desan Brame are all <laughs> from Kansas here. I, I think this could be one of those years that people talk about around that state for a long time as far as the talent production. Josh, uh, we're less than two weeks away from the spring game. I know that uh, they're having some portal guys come in that weekend. Is that also going to be a big recruiting weekend? I know I, I, it used to be a big recruiting weekend for Oklahoma. Are you expecting that to be the case this year? It, it still will be. I think I, the expectations got set so high in 2022 when they just had that unbelievable – weekend and it was the huge event you know you had the the statue being unveiled and there was just so much happening that really made you know that just made it a huge huge event for OU um this time I don't think it's going to be quite that big but again like you look at it I mean uh, we've talked about it before Nate Roberts is expected back Cortland Guillory is a guy that was there this weekend and is expected to be back on April 20th uh he's a guy I interviewed a couple weeks ago at the Under Armour camp in Houston um I think if Oklahoma really wants to push for him, they're going to be really hard to beat for Cortland Guillory. Uh, it's just a matter of where does he fall on their board, and I'm not saying I have that answer. I'm just saying, you know, I, th I think Kobe Sellers is kind of clearly the top guy, and then from there I think you can kind of get into some debate of where various players fall. So, um, and now I'm actually just sitting here thinking of it. I want to – I'm going to go backward for a second – Eddie asked me a guy that I think Oklahoma's in better shape with, and I I just completely blanked on this name. Um, I believe it's Shayante Stewart from Ohio, uh, a safety, excuse me, excuse me, a corner that came in. He is actually a guy that works with Reggie Powers, his dad. Interesting. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of familiarity there. And my general impression is OU is a legitimate contender there, but kind of like what I was just talking about, I don't know where he falls in what they plan to do at corner, like where they expect the numbers to fall. So that's going to be really interesting. But I do think that visit went really well. He's another guy I'm hoping to talk to today because he stayed through the weekend pretty much. So it's been, it was a big visit weekend for OU with him. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see where, where that leads us going forward, especially with the upcoming decision and you know a couple of days from Malik Hawkins. I was going to ask we 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 can't let uh, get you out of here before talking about Wednesday. It is kind of a big day. Malik Hawkins, the uh, younger brother of Oklahoma freshman quarterback Michael Hawkins expected to make his announcement as well as something that we talked about last week with Trent Wilson, the four-star defensive tackle out of uh, Maryland. He will be making his announcement on Wednesday as well. Josh, when we talked to you last week, felt pretty good about both of those guys getting a little bit closer to uh, decision day for both of them. Still feel pretty confident about both of them uh, turning to Oklahoma on Wednesday. Yeah, that that's still my expectation. Now, uh, with Malik, again, I, it would take something pretty, sure. pretty monumental for me to feel like anything was changing on that. With Trent, you know, you just wonder. Again, and it's, it's not his fault. It's just being from distance. You always wonder, like, is there something I don't know? Is there a part of the story I'm not familiar with? And, you know, I know um, there has been some connection of, well, once OU lost out of Landon Rink, they got more serious about, uh, you know, Trent Wilson. I don't know if that's valid or not. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I believe that's necessarily true. But what I do wonder is if it forces another school to kind of look back and say, okay, if we lose Trent Wilson, then we're really got to go down our board. So we're going to, you know, whether it's NIL or whatever it may be, we're going to up our offer a little bit here and, and make us, you know, as val you know, as, as a valid option for him as there could be. So we'll, uh, I'm watching that and still trying to see if I see anything kind of movement that at a late date, but right now I think Oklahoma's clearly the favorite to land both guys on Wednesday. That'd be uh, quite the Quite a big deal for Oklahoma, especially uh, when you talk about Todd Bates and continuing 
uh, progression on the defensive line. I know that, uh, George, you tweeted out the picture this morning, but David Stone had tweeted out a picture over the weekend. 297. I, yeah. Something tells me he's going to be able to get uh, three, four more pounds before the start of the football season with uh, Jerry Schmidt this summer. Uh, positive uh, momentum there on the defensive line. One more guy that is actually visiting today that you had put up on uh, the Crimson Corner over the weekend. Uh, ironically enough, a Southern California commitment by way of Florida, Dominic Kelly on campus Monday to uh, visit the Sooners. Yeah, big, long corner. Uh, committed to USC like two weeks ago. So this is all very new. I think it's a good sign that even after that decision, Oklahoma is able to get him on campus. You mentioned guy from Tampa Robinson uh, there in kind of, you know, northern Florida. I guess. I don't I can't. Florida is so hard for me to dissect of north, south. I don't know what central is. Um, but anyway, um, with him, I, I talked to him a little bit. Definitely, you know, you, I with a guy that makes a decision like this and does it so early and then immediately starts taking visits. This is what this gives Brent Venables legs, you know, like we don't want guys committing early. We don't want to worry about that because what is it actually given USC other than the pressure to maintain his commitment? Like if they lose him, well, you lost the commitment. Well, he was a sophomore in high school. Like, you know, like it, it's a, uh, it's an interesting kind of counterpoint to something that I, I've always kind of, uh, been more, I guess, on the Riley side of things. If you were gonna, I ooh, people are not gonna like that sentence at all. Yeah, you better but, watch um, it. <laughs> but no, you know, I, I just I, I hate turning down commitments. But this is a case where you say, uh, you know, how how serious could you be if you know you were excited enough to commit, and then two weeks later you're so up for USC that you're back at Oklahoma? That's no shot at the kid. It just you know, you wonder if maybe he rushed into it a little bit. Maybe he's not as sure. And clearly he's going to keep taking visits. So, again, that's that's a great sign for Oklahoma. And we all know they want to have a presence in Florida. So I think that's a – there's nothing but but wins here for Oklahoma. This is, this is just a good thing to have this guy on campus, especially on a, a low, more low-key day where they can really kind of pour into him and make sure he's getting plenty of attention. Real quick, something that just popped in my brain before we get you out of here as well is – you see Arkansas starting to produce quite a bit of talent. Obviously, Oklahoma's in on some 2025, 2026 kids. It seems like Oklahoma, even since maybe the Jaron Canick, has, uh, they've started recruiting Kansas a lot more than uh, maybe. Is it coincidence? Is it Brent Venables and staff starting to uh, maybe under uncover some guys that maybe just simply weren't getting attention? Is it a little bit of everything? Uh, I, I just find it kind of interesting that Oklahoma is starting to get into some of these schools and even like a school like Pecola here locally, or I guess within the state lines or Elgin, they're not having any trouble getting into some of these schools that you just haven't seen Oklahoma recruit before. Yeah. And I would say in like Kansas, Missouri, I don't think it's coincidental at all yeah. because I think when you look at Brent's track record for years. I mean, you go back to Brody Eldridge that nobody knew sure. about, and they, they bring him in for a camp. He kicks butt. They yeah. offer him, you know, like, the, um, and you can go, there's there's a whole bunch of guys like that that we, we could talk about, uh, you know, really forever. But I think with, um, when Oklahoma comes, A, when he was at Clemson, Brent Venables can't pour as much time and resource into Kansas and Missouri. He can't be there as often. He can't have boots on the ground. Oklahoma, you know, like this is, we're, we're going to give one guy Kansas. We're going to give one guy Missouri. And they're going to spend a lot of time knowing the, the states and the players in them and the coaches and making sure we know if there's a kid out in Western Kansas that we haven't seen yet, we want to know about him. And so I think they, and obviously OU makes that offer other people start taking it paying attention as to where for a long time and this is what Bill Snyder did so well Mark Mangino even to an extent would offer these Kansas kids and it was like well that's Kansas and K-State they're just offering in-state kids they didn't think anything about it but when Oklahoma goes up to Kansas or goes up to Missouri and makes an offer people start paying attention and I think it's also born of other schools recognizing there's more and more talent in those states and so again, I, I think it is, it's kind of a snowball where people start, you know, showing up more to recruit one guy. Well, they find a couple more and then they just realize, oh, there's a sophomore there and we'll be back for him. And so I do, I think it is just a slow rolling bit of momentum, but yeah, Oklahoma making an offer 
And that's why they have to be careful about it, who they mm-hmm. do offer, because not only, like we've talked about for years, Eddie, is someone more likely to commit when, uh, you know, from a state of Kansas player, from an Oklahoma player, from an Arkansas player, because of that proximity, they're more likely to take an Oklahoma offer just based on the numbers than a kid from Maryland or New York or wherever. But also, it's going to drag in all these other schools. Michigan's going to take notice. Alabama's going to take notice. You know, all these schools that maybe weren't really paying attention to that guy, now they're going to be in on the, you know, and taking a look at his at his tape again and kind of deciding if they need to go have a look. It seems like an obvious thing to say, but it like Brent Venables is he doesn't care where they're from or or what school they play for. If they can play football um, and have a high IQ, I think that he likes them. I mean, I think Wimberley is a good a good example of that. I mean, Oklahoma was in on him pretty early, weren't they, Josh? And and they don't typically just go out and recruit a ton of guys from Arkansas. So I think that you're seeing them um, obviously recruit locally, but they're just finding guys that um, you know fit their style of play and and. Again, it's obvious to say, but uh, I just think it's a different approach than what maybe we saw with the previous staff. There's no question. I mean, and they were in on Wimberley. They offered him in, I think, January 17th, if I remember yeah. right. I might be channeling my inner Bob Prisbillo there to have it that right. But, um, you know, there was – it wasn't crazy early, but, you know, they, they, they were – they weren't late, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, but I will say what I, what I think is the most clear difference is – Brent and these guys care about height, weight, speed. They do. Like let's let's not kid ourselves. But they're not so beholden to it that they're not going to offer a kid from here, there, or anywhere if they feel he's a really freaking good football player. They're, they're, that's not going to be as important to them because, like, is Marcus Wimberly six two two ten and going to go run four four tomorrow? No, he's not. But he's a freaking good football player. Like and. And it's not like he doesn't have physical abilities. I don't want to make it sound like I'm downplaying him at all. But I'm just saying, I think for several reasons, I don't know that the previous staff would have recruited Marcus Wimberly. Sure. And I, I, for Oklahoma, I've never gotten the impression there was any hesitation under Brent Venables. They liked him. They knew what they offered him. And they made him a priority almost from word go. That's what kind of makes this spring a little bit fun because we're starting to see some of those guys that might have fit that bill uh, just in terms of just a football player, they're going to find a spot for him like a Lewis Carter here this spring and see how that kind of translates. And it's going to be kind of fun to see how, uh, you know, all the uh, identification and whatever that you want to call it about the way that Brent Venables is running this program right now. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch it all uh, come together. Yeah, I think. I think. Unless they're all wrong and everybody sucks and they go 3-11 and 11 and or 3-8 and eight and we'll be coming here and we'll be talking about probably a new coach. So that's a good spot to end because uh, now everybody's depressed. How about that? We will have a practice report. We will have week. a practice report. We're going to be back out talking to uh, players on Wednesday. Yep. Uh, we'll talk to, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, maybe we'll get, maybe this is the week we'll get Zach Alley with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the eclipse outside. Maybe it's going to change some things. But no, Josh, it sounded like it was a good uh, weekend down in Norman. Always good to see. I know that it made waves on the internet over the weekend. Uh, Sam Bradford back in town uh, to uh, kind of hang out with uh, some of the recruits and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I, those events are kind of, uh, I guess, just kind of strange nowadays. Or not strange, but it's just kind of uh, become common for everybody to have these recruiting events throughout the spring and uh, you know certainly Oklahoma's taking advantage of it so Josh we appreciate it yeah I'm glad to be here sorry I thought there was more there Eddie. no that's it no that's uh, it gl- glad I, to be here but yeah uh I I will say Eddie I can't tell you how old it makes me feel to see DeMarco and Sam taking pictures where they're like just casual as they could be like yeah. just you know some chinos you know just just relaxed as they could be and you're like this is this is a life I am. I am too old to be living. It's effed up. As much as I, uh, I love the kids. I'm glad they didn't put the kids in there because uh, I think Sam's oldest kid is getting about like halfway up to his uh, waist now. It's like, oh my god. You we're, think we could get Sam really on the show? Old these days. Uh, yeah, we could try. That'd be um, awesome. Probably not Masters Week. I think he's headed down to Augusta. But uh, wow, that's yeah. cool. Living the life. Played there a couple weeks ago. So. That's just the life that Sam Bradford le- uh, leads these days. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It was good to see Marcus Wimberly jump into uh, the boat, Oklahoma's 11th commitment in the 2025 class. And uh, it's going to be uh, kind of a fun spring here over the next couple of weeks, especially as spring football fires, you know, something back up into 
what is going to be, uh, you know, I think kind of the culmination of it with the spring game coming up on April 20th. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun to kind of just see what we've been seeing at practice, actually like out on the field competing yeah. against one another. Should be uh, pretty good. So for Josh, for George, I'm Eddie. We'll see you right back here on the Suterscoop.com YouTube channel next time. This has been a spring-ish Heisman Hangout recruiting report.